Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage your moderator, Summer Flynn from the Dolls of Horror podcast. And now we have Billy and Lisa Zane. This film 
was Ed Wood's final opus as a script that was as yet unfilmed. And uh, his wife had it, a director I had met, had convinced her to relinquish it. It was saved from a fire from his house. It was the only object he took. It was the only print of it. It wasn't electro uh, electronically saved. It just had this weird, bizarre journey. Long story longer, the film was a <laughs> silent film. Yes. There was no dialogue in it. However, leave it to Ed Wood to make it about a character with a sonic disability. <laughs> totally wow. insane and completely bizarre. It's a crime spree morality tale about this deranged thief who wears drag of a nurse to sneak, oh, to, to sneak out of a, uh, of a, of a um, insane asylum. It's story. not his pension, it was just, <laughs> it was just, you know, it's how he could get out. Um, and, um, and it's filled with, yeah, really, and it's uh, filled with like 30 incredible cameos. Like, I mean, cast off the top of your head, Sandra Bernhardt, Christina Ricci. John Ritter. John Ritter. Uh, Taylor Thomas. And Taylor <laughs> Thomas, uh, uh, Rick Schroeder, Andy McCarthy, yeah. uh, Ron Perlman. Stephen uh, Weber. Who? Stephen Weber. Stephen Weber. Oh, Stephen Weber. <laughs> Will Patton. Good. You know, I mean, it just goes on. on and on. Uh, Timmy Hedman's in this movie. Yes, Timmy um, Hedman. Eartha Kitt. Eartha Kitt. She yeah. is the only person who speaks because she sings yeah. in the film. Performs a number. And it's on our Very excited. <laughs> Two larger pointers. Sonic disability. Did I mention the sonic disability? <laughs> well, she says she's still having trouble because we last year with the speaker when we came in. That's <laughs> uh, Anyway, funny movie. It was the first. It was the first movie to be leaked to the internet in like 2000. Oh my god. Uh, it, it it had a very weird and sordid release. Like went out for a week and then distributor died. It was just bizarre. It, it, and you could only find it in Germany on a bootleg DVD. It's, just, it's been consistently Ed Wood yeah. <laughs> right to the point Ed where you gotta find it. I had a real tough time finding it on DVD. Yeah. It's the only copy I found on eBay selling for like $70 dollars and I'm broke. And so, but I found a but seller. But worth it. It's an Easter egg. Yeah, I found it. a seller really? and it does not look like a bootleg so I'm going an actual copy. Yeah, it's a beautiful film. Yeah, it was great. And like I said, it was so interesting. But because you talked about, and he talked about your, your song in it. Oh, he said the song. Right? right? Yes. So, anyways, I just had to tell that, that really funny story because I had no idea that my dear friend was in that movie. And I was like, well, if I'd known that, was a Bond a long time ago. No, he's, the, the, he's the last close up of a giant, crazy fight scene that, right. and that comes on the heels of Earth the Kids being song, damn number. Yeah, yeah. I certainly noticed I had some original to it. Yeah. Anyways, do we have any audience questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. I um, I actually had the pleasure of doing an episode of the series. I don't know if you yeah. saw that with uh, Martin Sheen. Oh, Cook Pams. Yep. Well, Cook Pams. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was that was the name. Uh, no. No. It was about a magician. We were magicians, rival magicians. I think you're thinking of the Christopher Reeve one. And uh, thank you for confusing me with Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all, all the time. All the time. Well, doing the film was uh, uh, one of my favorite experiences. Um, the, um, Mr. Dickerson, our director, who was you know visionary and really fun, was very welcoming and inviting um, of uh, suggestion, and there was a lot of improvisation. It was an incredible cast. Uh, in a very contained uh, narrative, and uh, they let me, you know, I tested the waters and started trying, you know, some comedy in a character that wasn't necessarily written as funny, um, and they, you know, kept 
let me go and I kept pushing to see where the boundary was where the women would come in and they never stopped me. So I was like, you should, can, I keep, can I do this? And I go, really? Is anyone is waiting for the hook? Never came. And I went, okay, this is, okay, here we go. And they were just very generous. Um, and the, the catch, release, and balance of great in-camera gore and wonderful you know, effects by Todd Masters and his gang doing great creature effects everything pretty much in camera was, uh, you know, which was at times shocking and genuinely scary and kind of fun, uh, was balanced by um, a false sense of security and some good laughs. Yeah, so just when you're lulled into her, you find something charming, bam, you know, someone's head gets punched through and you know, a crazy thing happens like that didn't just happen. So I highly recommend it. It's kind of like a starter drug for horror if you're you know, introducing people to the genre. Hey, what's that? What did you say? Yeah, right. Yeah. Where was that? It's, uh, yes, I love that movie. Do you have a favorite scene to shoot from David Knight? Do you have a favorite scene that you shot, like while you were shooting? Um, I like the scene with. Uh, I mean, the the there's people seem to like this kind of funny little. Uh, number I do after I, I, I come in and you think they, they set me up as the hero in a way like a western hero with a hat and a duster and I come in and you think I'm look I'm almost like a bounty hunter and then it's revealed that I'm in fact the villain in this movie and I dive through this window it's clear I got some weird powers and I lose this hat and jacket because we had to lose the hat and jacket which the question was how do we get rid of this outfit in an organic way and it just kind of came out in a funky little dance and a song <laughs> that seemed to resonate um, you gotta see it to understand what I'm saying uh, that was kind of fun and the scene with Thomas Hayden Church on the stairwell um, was really fun uh, when there's this blood seal that we have to you know either remove from, you know it's one of the barrier I can't cross. I produced this sponge out of my mouth, which was kind of funny. Which just, again, happened as a result of asking, you know, hey, you got a sponge? Can you wash it? <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Um, yeah, fun scene. Lisa, do you have a favorite scene uh, for Freddy Dead? Yeah, I really like John swinging the knives at him. Yeah. The, the physicality of wrestling with him because he's such a good physical actor, you know. So that was fantastic. It was it was like the Olympics of physical acting, you know, that guy. And it was fun to, you know, fling his knives. Yeah. Yeah. The whole the whole like. I really like that final act. The yeah. final act, yeah. But yeah, it was interesting. That was yeah. really fun. Yeah. I like my outfit too. It was kind of sporty. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think so. Um, any other questions? Why was there any more um, sequels to Phantom? I mean, like, you had the whole one story of the Skull to Tuganda, but there was, I mean, you could have done so many sequels. Why wasn't there more any projects on that? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, it came out a little ahead of its time and right at a window that over time I think was more. Um, Appreciated in terms of its uh, white hat heroism, you know, and a character who was pretty well adjusted, you know, pretty happy hero, dug his gig, you know, uh, which was great. But at that particular time, we were beginning this love affair with the anti hero in cinema. Everything was a little dark and edgy, and you know, that's cool. And it, we, it, I think they went down that path. Um, and now I feel it's logical to do because we're you know 20 years later or whatever it is on this point, and uh, it's a father-son franchise. I mean, like that's kind of their their business, <laughs> you know, do gooding, and uh, and it's it's logical that that mantle would be passed. So I'd love to do another one. I think it's timely to introduce you know the kid. Train and hand off to get. I mean, we've been speaking about it, and it's something that we're, you know, 
really needs to happen because that is your torch and legacy. Thank you. I'm, I'm a big fan of it, and I think you know people love the character. I think it's um, it's come around at a time where I think we need um, the kind of example of moral compass and uh, you know. Did joyful. you actually see the sci-fi film in the original one? I'm sorry. Did you actually see the sci-fi film? Because they made a sci-fi film about it like years ago. Yeah. And no. they actually made an actual 80s. Movie. <laughs> 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 That's okay. Yours is better. I would have. <laughs> I would have, but it just kind of turned out. I, 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 I was about to rent it one night. Uh, rubber video stores. <laughs> Gotta love physical media. I still do. Right? If I saw one on uh, called Rocket Video, I loved it. And they just, uh, the, the response wasn't that great about it. But I, you know, I support the franchise. And, you know, I love the, I love the publishers. You know, I love the characters. To do, but uh, we're talking to folks at Paramount about it, and uh, we haven't talked to King World. We'll get everyone in concert, I assume. I'll tell you what, write them and ask for it. <laughs> the thing that's going to make it happen is if the fans, uh, him who you know, genuinely love uh, this, uh, this story, really galvanize it. There's so much story, though, that's into this Phantom one. That you can just pass the torch on, like the training section, to another, you know, jewel piece like the skull, or even your skull ring. They can pass the torch to that. Uh, I'm sure they're hiring me that. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a security guard. Thank you. Your ideas are so critical. Should bring them in. Write them in. I saw you come up with the way back. Okay, or yeah. yeah. That would be it. <laughs> that would be the line at the end of the day. Did you come that I was talking, were you, in, were you in here when we were talking about that scene? Or did you just fly in? I, I, I missed it. You missed it. We were just talking about that. No, what was scene? Someone, asked, someone said, what's your favorite scene? I'm going to let you describe it to him. <laughs> no, that was improvised. <laughs> That was one of, yeah, we were just saying that they had, we had to figure out how to get rid of the hat and the coat. And I said, I got it, I got it. Okay. <laughs> That's what came up. Devil. 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 <laughs> you were the horns. Um, one of my favorite films that you were in was Orlando with Tilda Swift. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Talk about Certainly. that experience. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was one of, I guess, Tilda's early films, maybe first or second, I think. She was um, amazing. Um, Sally Potter, the writer-director, was based on a Virginia Woolf novel. Um, it was uh, beautifully art-directed by the same D Dutch team who did Peter Greenaway's films, who were known for their maximalism at cost. And it was, it was really uh, extraordinary for what they pulled off of the budget at that time. And I was so thrilled to be part of it because it was, it, you know, it's, it's an allegory and a weird little journey of this time traveling, sex changing, really, uh, character who, by waking up every, you know, few hundred years, she turned, you know, she, she picked, wakes up in a period as a woman when the rights for a woman are absolutely, you know, impossible and wakes up as a man when the, what it means to be a man is to die for your country and go to you know go to war. It's like it's like the shit end of the stick every time you grew up. You know, she's like really, and it's kind of an interesting journey through um, uh, through our ages, uh, shining a light on gender politics. And, and then of course you show up. And I turn up. Romancer and give her a baby. I get, you know. He turns up as an adventure. Each ca each sequence is categorized by you know love, death, sex, and I turned up in the sex <laughs> sequence, which I thought was very uh, convenient. Uh, turned out to be useful. And turned out to be useful. <laughs> it's a beautiful movie. I highly recommend you see it. Thank you. You had one. Angel. Yes, you. Yes, him. Me. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, as my favorite uh, cameo in Zoolander, I just wonder, <laughs> can we have a walk off? <laughs> it's a walk. It's a walk. <laughs> Have you seen Zoolander too? Yes. Huh? yes. I think it's, it's a real generous film. It's great. It's, it's so generous. <laughs> it's, it is. It's really funny. It's like it's lush and hysterical. It says it says twisted and fun is the first, but you know it really lands. I love. I mean, it's funny you get you know, more love for playing yourself for five minutes than thirty years ago. <laughs> should have should have done that earlier. Right? <laughs> there. Who you got? Speaking of Zoolander, you've been in a movie with uh, David Bowie. You've been in a movie with uh, Alice Cooper. Is there any time where you've been starstruck on set? Oh, always. <laughs> so, many, so many times. Um, yeah, and it's often for the rock stars. And, you, know, it's a, you know, it's kind of like the movie stars. Like when you're, you know, David Bowie. Oh. What were you Zoolander. He, he, he judged the walk-off. <laughs> he judged what? No, it was, we were on different days. We shared a edit. Yeah. 
iceberg. I didn't kill 2,000 people. <laughs> a little angry, my girlfriend slept with another guy. And I said, big stretch. <laughs> Jeez, she made room somewhere else. Oh, so anyway, listen, family show. Um, yeah, love that character. If you watch it again with the concept that I played it like a comedy, you will laugh and enjoy it. Because it was, he was so, the absurdity of the character, like the, the hubris was something that um, Jim Cameron and I enjoyed to no end because, you know, the character is, is such a mirror for the age and the and a big kind of theme of the film that led to this tragedy, as, a, as is everyone, but in particular, Cal was crafted to just represent why that thing, you know, was such a tragedy in so many ways. And the, um, the yes, the arrogance, yes, the, you know, the, the it was just, we found ourselves laughing at, at the fact that he just didn't, you know, of course he was getting off the boat. There was no question he was getting off the boat. The sinking was almost like a nuisance, you know. It's like, where's the chick, you know, what's going on? Um, and that was, it was, um, it was wonderful to play because he was so, you know, uh, yes, despicable, somehow relatable, but you know, but um, funny to me in a weird way and kind of entertaining. That was just my own personal twisted humor, I guess, <laughs> appreciating the gig. But, you know, it seemed to pay off. I'm glad you hate me. That's cool. <laughs> no, I like you now. No, it's okay. I was 12 years old. I like you now. Yes, you. Hi, Jim. Hi. Hi. Nobody turns down the phantom, but Rose did. Uh, oh. <laughs> Rose I was did. wearing that purple spandex. That tuxedo. <laughs> the water was cold. Yes, sir. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the fictional or non-fictional character that you wanted to be. When I was young, I, for many years, I wanted to be Zorro. papers with a Z. <laughs> and Zorro was cool. It was like Batman. Tyrone Power was Zorro. Lisa, uh, is there a fictional character that you want to be? I don't know. Um, fictional character? Oh, I like, you know, I like the classics. I wanted to be Juliet very badly. I wanted to be Camille. <laughs> I wanted to be um, a bunch of, you know, I wanted to be Kate. Can you hear her? Yeah. You're in the front row and it's mezzo mezzo. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, yeah, so the, 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 the sort of, I wanted to play the classics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some great, uh, there's some great That's theater true. roles. Yeah. Some Tennessee Williams roles, you know? <laughs> or like Trier. Jack Ross. You know, you guys both came from the theater, correct? In the beginning? Well, sort of. Yeah. In the beginning, I'm not while. sure. For a short while. Started out, yeah, a couple, yeah. And if you, I know you went back to Chicago. I saw you in, in Chicago um, when you were doing the Sound of Music at the Hojo. I ran into you coming out the turnstile. <laughs> I was running home. But, um, have you done any theater since? Or you since when? Well, you know what? Um, Probably doing films. I started, yeah, my first few roles as an actress were theater roles, for sure. I was in the Cherry Orchard, and I was in this restoration and comedy, you know, in Chicago, and um, some other stuff. And then, um, yeah, in, I, I originated the role of, I don't know if I know, it's to a Kiss, Meg Ryan. So I originated that role on stage, yeah, those kinds of things, you know, for a while early on. Have you done anything since? On stage, I created a, a show 
perform them or teach them to that point. But it was a, it was, you know, the rehearsal period was pretty short and it was kind of grueling and a lot of fun, to say the least. Are you um, telling me you could have planned your free performance in Demon Knight? I could have what? Your tango in Demon Knight? You didn't want to use that? <laughs> there was that. <laughs> Maybe it would have been Johnny Castle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, movie-wise, oh, but it was good, you know. It's like the Phantom, you lost a pound of flesh every day on that thing. I was, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of cuts and bruises and blood. Uh, there was no, you know, uh, there was no protection in that suit, which is why it looked so good. They had to, they had to prepare. They had to, a lot of sewing and a lot of reading, like, oh, you know, washing the blood. I do remember that I did do this play in Chicago. It was a, it was a, it was by Afra Ben, uh, who was a rare kind of female playwright in the Restoration era. And it was called, um, man, I can't remember what it was called. But all I know is that I literally had to eat a steak before every performance because it was exhausting. It was physically exhausting, and I just. And there's some worlds where you just, you know, just want to eat nothing, you know, and float through like a ghost. And then some worlds you really need your protein, and that was one of them. And I do remember that. I had, it was Chicago, so I'd go to like Miller's Pub and have a big thing, like every and night. And And then just because they were crazy, costume changes, and they were running and running, and it was just like kind of a farce, you know. So what theater was that at? The Good Moon. That's a lot. <laughs> well, that's Never. Never. Um, Billy, I want to talk to you about um, Lucid. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How did that come about? And has anyone seen Lucid? No? Well, please check it out. It's streaming on Tubi. You can watch it right now. <laughs> How did that come about? Uh, it's about lucid dreaming, and it's really interesting. It's kind of a, bit of a thriller. Seen structurally, but really it's about the anatomy of a kiss, of the first kiss, and the kind of you know, kid who's on the spectrum. I had anxiety too. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dream therapist who's his neighbor who notices he's having some issues and offers my assistance as a counselor. And I spend most of the film as he spends most of his life at you know, pajamas. Perfect for COVID time. He sleeps a lot, but, you know, he has to sleep because he's, he's doing this for people. But, uh, but it's a really, it's kind of a, a very cool character. I really love playing him. He had the kind of uh, you know, charming, affable nature of a Bill Murray, like, you know, wacky uncle, um, but who offered really sound uh, advice and safe space for this kid to kind of, you know, Explore and come out of his shell a little bit while in his dream state he's exploring and confronting a lot of these barriers. But it's beautifully shot and really well acted by great cast. Is that Australian was it? It was English. It was English. a fit in here. Yeah. yeah, it was a beautiful film. But I curiously, the, the director was legally blind. Yeah, I heard that. It's a true story. And uh, it's it's a brilliant film. It's won, it won quite a bit of awards. Um, and the irony that, you know, this guy was technically just, just, just like almost completely blind. You could see shapes, maybe. Shapes, maybe, but yeah. he trusted, you know, it came later in life. Um, um, Adam Morse, you can read about him. There's quite a few interesting articles if you look up Lucid and Adam Morse. Um, very talented fellow, um, who is just has taken upon this job. He's acting now, he does quite a few, got an acting career, he's really embraced to use this seeming deficit as an asset to kind of, you know, challenge himself and build upon. He had built a, uh, or shaped a, a sensibility, an aesthetic sensibility early in life, and then hired people who he trusted to execute. Um, but he didn't tell us, I didn't know this until the fourth day of filming, 
because they were afraid I wouldn't do the movie if I knew the director was flying. <laughs> so I showed up in England, I was wondering where he's like two inches from the biggest monitor on set I've ever seen. I'm like, hey, IMAX, what's going on? <laughs> and he's like, I'm, uh, I'm leaving the light. I'm like, Fantastic. <laughs> you need another one? He's like, no, 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 we're good. Okay, great, bring it on. So that's genius. Um, so he listens to the tape, he stands up close, it's like, you know, very discerning. The movie's beautiful. But uh, fascinating film. Very talented film. Absolutely. All right, more questions? Yes, sir. Just, just a question, Billy, not trying to get too personal, but what What's the one thing that you are most proud of at this point in your life? Um, you know, I know it's a bad answer, but it's true. You know, my kids, uh, to be honest, I, they're pretty awesome. Little girls. No, no, I want to know. Because I want to know. I want to know. That takes the cake. Um, uh, I attribute any success I've had to service. You know, it was a organizing principle I kind of stumbled into early on, by you know certainly at the and in stewardship of really great parents, you know, and some other surrogates who imparted with really great pearls of wisdom along the way. My sister was a great influence, you know, and uh, when I apply a lot of those great life lessons and remember to. And, balance it, <laughs> check the ego a little, and really kind of let those things, just uh, spread the wealth with new artists, and then see how they come around. Like, there's people who are coming back to me now who remind me that I met them when they were young, and I was practicing this early, and I was early in my career, and I clearly met them early on, and 20 years later, 15 years later, they have done some amazing things, and have reached out and said, I took your advice, and it and I've done this, that makes me really proud. That's awesome. It's like, it's kind of like a teacher gene. I don't know, there's something about it. We have some educators in our family and it was just, I didn't realize it, but I think it's in the DNA. That just turned me on. Share, just imparting with, you know, some sound knowledge that they, you know, others have had. Um, I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lisa, do you have an answer for that one? Um, I'd probably still be alive. I, I took some risks, and I'm just glad I'm still alive. Like, I shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> I think that's kind of I'm all proud, of us. I'm proud right? to survive. Life's hard. I mean, life's rocky. Touchy. Not for the week. Found money. <laughs> hey, but we are all still here right now today, right? And that's good. Anyone? Any others? Oops. Good thing, good. The Titanic question kind of brought back a memory. I thought I remembered an interview with with you right when it released, where you seemed like you were kind of taken aback by how people would treat you in public. Were there any more notable exchanges that stuck out um, in the time after Titanic that kind of felt a little like, oh. Um, briefly, I mean, of course, it's always, you know, interesting and surprising the, the impact of something of this magnitude had had. But just afterwards, I had filmed in, in Morocco, and I was doing a, a miniseries about Cleopatra uh, for the Hallmark Channel, for ABC or something. It's kind of a fun tune, by the way. Check it out if you haven't. Played Mark Anthony, it's a great treat to do. But took a break from it and went deep into the Sahara on a bit of an adventure with a couple of guides, rode camel, and then a camel group. Jeep to camel and camel to tent, did it overnight. And when we got to this Bedouin tent, we lifted it and they were making some tea and it's under the crazy stars. And the dude looked up, pulled back his jalaba, looking like Obi Wan, looked at me and he went, Great movie! And I went, <laughs> And I realized that the sphere of influence at that point was really dynamic. You know? I was like, damn, this, this movie's big. I didn't see any, like, there's no electricity out there. There was, I don't know what they were watching this. And this was, this was early, you know, these were early days. There was probably like a Russian bootleg that came out before the movie for all I know. But damn, it was, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was, a, that was a memorable exchange. 
On that note, folks, I think we've got to love you and leave you and get back to the tables. We'll see you over there. What a pleasure, and thank you for your questions. Yeah. Easy yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause. Yeah.